So I am Paul Armstrong, as Jared mentioned. I work on the Twitter Lite application, um, the new Twitter, actually. We're rolling it out to desktop users as well, as some of you may have seen. Um, and move fast with confidence is what I want to talk about today. And that's what the smaller subset of my team and I work on um, for Twitter all the time. This is our charter. Um, and I want to share with you the tools and strategies that we've used and that you can use too to service this goal. And I want to take a moment to just kind of step back and, and kind of alleviate a little bit of a misconception that Twitter is actually a very small web team. When we first started Twitter Lite, we were probably about seven people, um, and we were working that way for a number of years. Now we're 24 people, but the number of people that are working on my team directly um, and on this move fast with confidence stuff is four or five, depending on how you look at it. So these are all things that any team can do. And I also want to share with you some things that you can do right out of the box that are available today um, without any, any upfront knowledge or any big investment. So move fast with confidence is kind of a play on uh, another, another company's old slogan, which was move fast and break things. But it's really move fast and don't break things, right? And that's really what we want to do. Um, so over the years, uh, Twitter has run a bunch of various stacks um, and frameworks. Some of them, um, even our most recent before now, was incredibly slow, both running it on the servers and for developers iterating, uh, iterating on it. It could take, I would hear, I've never actually worked on it, so this is all hearsay, uh, 30 to 40 minutes to do a build of the application before you could start testing it. And that's one of the reasons why we moved on to faster tools, like many of us here today have moved on to. Node.js, React, GraphQL, service workers, serverless deployments, it goes on and on and on. All of the things that people in this room are using now that make our lives much better, much faster as we go. And one of the things that I want to seed with you today is it's kind of a big vision, and it's kind of hard to, to really understand all the time, but it's that I believe that you can unlock performance for your users by increasing your development speed. And I know this is pretty big thinking, and it's kind of weird. Um, but bear with me, because in order to move fast, you have to have confidence in your ability to do that. When you start adding more features, deploying more often, adding people to your team who haven't been ingrained in it for so long, they all need to be confident that what they're doing won't cause any problems for users and will live on for a long time. So to do that, we avoid having specific knowledge and manual processes on things. And with that in mind, we took a look at our development process at each step of the way and looked at where it might be possible to remove some of that specific knowledge that's needed or maybe automate some of that. So this is a, a, actually a slightly stripped down version of our life cycle of how you code at Twitter. Um, and yours may look somewhat like this. Hopefully it's actually pretty close to this because we believe that some of the things that we're doing are very good and they, they help us iterate really quickly. Um, so we write code locally and then we submit it for review. Um, you may call it a pull request on GitHub. And then we usually have automated checks. These are in the form of CI you might use. Uh, maybe if you're lucky, you get to use GitHub Actions now. Um, I've got it on one of my open source projects. It's really fun. Or maybe it's Circle CI or Travis CI or something like that. Um, and then even better, we have a short life cycle or a short life staging instance that automatically gets deployed. This allows a reviewer or even the, de the developer themselves to go and check and ensure that the things that they've written work correctly. And sometimes, if things are particularly scary, um, usually server-side changes in our node platform that could impact performance of how quickly we can respond to a request, we might canary that. Um, and, and by canary, I mean that we actually put a small subset of our production traffic straight to one of these instances and see how this instance reacts and see how quickly um, it can respond. And we watch a bunch of different metrics on it. Um, and then in terms of submitting for review, we might have a reviewer look at that and they go back and forth with the, with the original author back and forth. So we get a little extra there. And then eventually it gets accepted and we merge it to master. After something's merged to master, we send it off to an internal staging. 
And this we used to call dog fooding. I don't know if you know the, the saying, eat your own dog food. Uh, it's a little weird saying. I think maybe it's hopefully only in the US because it's kind of gross. Um, but now we call it early bird. Um, and it's a little more Twitter type thing where it's an internal only. All employees are actually forced onto the most recent version of Twitter at all times. So every time code is merged, we stage that up and every single Twitter employee is using this. We get bugs really quickly uh, or, or issues posted to us really quickly when this happens. Um, and then eventually it goes to master or production rather. Um, and so how we want to look at this, so I cross a bunch of these out. And I cross them out because they're all part of that manual process that we actually can't really remove. So review, um, another person actually physically has to go look at that code at some point. We can automate a, a bunch of that away with the automated checks, and I'll talk about those in a moment. But for the most part, they're, they're manual. Merging to master, there's nothing really to do there. And once it hits production, it's already in production. You can't really do much there other than roll back, um, which we really don't want to do at any point. So in terms of automating and removing uh, places where you have to have specific knowledge to check something, we look at writing code locally, how we can enhance our automated checks, how we can get more information, more signal than noise from our canary instances or our internal staging instances. And so what I want to talk about today are those three things. Increasing local developer confidence and speed, automating more of the pull request process, and catching errors before they hit production. So, working locally. Never skip the basics. I know this has probably been beaten into people many, many times, but test-driven development, linting, auto-formatting using Prettier, I hope we're all using that now, uh, and static type checking. And I know a lot of people aren't using it yet. Uh, I really encourage you to check it out and start using it. Maybe you all move on to Reason. Um, I think m maybe the last two talks convinced you all that it was great. But one of the things that I, with local development is that context switching kills productivity. Every time we switch tasks or spin out a flow, we waste a lot of time because spinning back up can take 10 or 15, 20 minutes um, any time that you start something else and you, and you have to come back and remember what you were doing and how you were approaching that problem. One of those is a Slack message that I used to see a lot, which was, ugh. See, I took 15 minutes before it told me that I had a lint failure. I forgot a semicolon or something stupid like that. Um, so a, a little bit of a story to talk about that context switching as well. When this happens, and you submit something up for review, and you say, well, I know that CI is going to take me 15 minutes before it actually builds, so I'm going to start working on something else. I look at email. I find a bug. It looks interesting. I start spinning up on it. There's 10 minutes. Um, doing that, and then I start working on it a little bit, 15 minutes goes by, and all of a sudden my coworker pings me and says, hey, I was going to review your change, but uh, it's failing uh, the CI, so I'll look at it later. <sighs> this is the most annoying thing, because I thought it was all good, right? So I, I'm like, okay, I'll drop what I just started working on, and now I've just wasted those 15 minutes, right, coming up to this. And since I'm annoyed, I'm probably going to go grab a snack, um, maybe a coffee. And then I'm eventually going to come back. There's another 10, 15 minutes, right? And so I start spinning up on this, and I go, oh, it was a single line lint failure. So I go in, I fix that, and I push it back up. Now it's going to be another 15 minutes before I can actually get somebody to review that because CI failed the first time. They're definitely not going to review it until it's passing. And so here I've wasted 45 minutes, maybe even an hour, on something that could have been done in just a couple minutes. So what I want to do is I want to fail faster. And that means that we can make checks fail quickly with pre-commit hooks. And I hope that you're doing these. So we can only test related files locally. We can only lint related files lately. We can apply auto formatting to the files that were changed locally. And we can do all of our type checking, because type checking is actually fairly fast. Um, and I say only these files because at Twitter, we have over 1,400 unit tests. If we were to run all of those on a developer machine, it can take four to seven minutes, even with parallelization. Um, so if you're just changing a couple of files, it seems really unnecessary to run all 1,400 tests on a developer machine on something that they're fairly confident about. So here's what we do. We use Husky. Um, I hope that you're using it. It's, it's available now. 
um, or it's been available for quite a long time, to manage your, your Git hooks. So anytime you set up Husky the first time and a developer pulls down your Git repo and runs install, whether it's Yarn or NPM, they will automatically have installed the base part of the Husky hooks. And so anytime you update, add, or change any of your Git hooks for all of your, all of your developers on your team, they will all get those changes every time they, every time they pull from master. So in this case, we've got a pre-commit hook. It runs uh, TypeScript. We don't actually use TypeScript. I can get to that in a minute. Um, and then it runs Lint Staged. And Lint Staged is the other piece of this puzzle that allows you to do the minimal piece of everything. So it only runs across the changed files. In this case, it's looking at star.js and JSX. You can add TS, TSX here as well for TypeScript users. And run ESLint with the fix. Always have ESLint fix things for you. Don't require people to do it on their own. Same thing with Prettier, it's the same idea. Prettier will change the files, rewrite them for you. And then it runs git add. So what that's doing is it's restaging those files into your commit when you're trying to do it. So you never actually have to see what happened in those changes. And then once all of that's done, we run Jest with the find related test flag which, which tries to do its best to find out which tests are related to the files that I've changed. So it walks the dependency tree of all of your files and just runs the tests that are related to it. And then there's also this flag I added here called bail. What bail does is as soon as your tests fail, it quits and it prints out that error. So we can, we're able to fail immediately as fast as possible because a lot of times what I found personally is that I start running tests over here and I start reading email or Twitter over here and I'm not really paying attention. But as soon as that stops moving on the other side, I know that something's wrong. So it's really quick, it's really, really quick feedback. And so now, instead of it taking 15 minutes for me to know that I have a simple little failure and potentially wasting a whole entire hour waiting and going back and forth with my, my other developers, I actually have a really high chance of finding out in just a few seconds whether or not I should continue working on this same problem or whether I'm done. So uh, we're done. That's basically it. It doesn't take 15 minutes anymore. I, it actually takes just a few seconds. And another one of my favorite conversations from Slack, and this is still working locally, is, hey, is anyone else having trouble running the server from the master branch? And this is the most annoying thing because the answer is always, well, did you install node modules? And so, oh yeah, I didn't do that. Let me do that quick. So I wanted to automate this away. And we can still do that with git, com with, uh, git commit hooks. And so here I've posted up, actually, it's just three extra little lines that we've added here on post checkout, post merge, and post rebase. And the, the, the one tricky bit of this is on checkout, because when you do a git checkout, sometimes you're checking out a file, which means you're undoing the changes that you've done to it before, since your last stage. Um, we actually only want it to run when you check out a branch. So Husky exposes this parameter called Husky git params, and we can check that to determine whether or not we should install modules again or not. So at this point, we basically eliminated the need for any developer to manually run module, install modules unless they're specifically installing a new module that no one else has done before. So it's great. I completely removed this from our Slack channel and it makes me really, really happy. And then the next one, and this is partially development and this is partially onto the staging portion of this. And that's, well, waiting for my staging builds takes too long. And I agree completely. Because it took 12 minutes and 18 seconds. 12 minutes and 18 seconds just to build the application. Granted, it's much better than the old Scala stack of being about 40 minutes, but it's still too long for actionable feedback. And this includes over 40 languages, server-side code, service worker assets, and over 140 client-side JavaScript artifacts, weighing in at over 1.9 megabytes. It's a lot that it builds. So myself and one of my teammates looked at that and we said, this is too much. Let's find out how to cut this down. And so we ran this command, which is node dash dash inspect dash brk on top of our webpack build. And when you do this with the inspect break flag, you end up with a Chrome Inspector instance. And this looks just like what you get in the browser. You get a profiler tab, a console tab, a sources tab, and a memory tab. 
And we went through that, and we dug through, and we found the little pieces that were taking too long. We found the bits that were, were using too much memory. And as we started looking into that, we said, huh, this dependency, this plugin that we're using is actually causing a lot of issues. And it was actually icing on the cake for us because we'd been wanting to get rid of this plugin for quite a while. Uh, this was the React Globalize plugin, uh, React Globalize Webpack plugin. It's, an, it's for doing internationalization for all of our different languages. Um, it had been a, a bit slow and it had been dated in terms of getting support for Webpack 4, so we were actually stuck using Webpack 3 and not able to jump up to Webpack 4 because of this plugin. So there were many, many reasons that we wanted to get off it. And we ended up rewriting our internationalization pipeline. And in doing so, we removed three, over three minutes from a full production build. So we're down from 12 minutes to nine minutes. And I said, nine minutes, well, that's still way too slow. So we kept looking and noticed that we are actually building our client code twice. And this was actually still related to internationalization support. Due to the way that CSS modules are built when you're separating left to right and right to left languages, you actually end up having to build all of your code twice, once for the left to right and once for the right to left. And we had to, we had to serve that content differently to users who were using one of those types of languages. So thanks to React Native Web, which was actually presented here a couple years ago by one of my colleagues, uh, Nicholas Gallagher, and the wonderful solution that is the CSS and JS stylesheet API from React Native that's been ported to React Native Web, it actually remo helped us remove all of our CSS modules all into the CSS and JS. So everything's done at runtime in terms of left to right and right to left flipping. So we're actually able to cut out that second build entirely. And lo and behold, we cut from nine minutes to just under five minutes, a whole four minutes off of our build times just by removing the CSS modules and doing everything the same way across the board. And I said, you know what, that's faster, and I really like it, but it still could be better. So we're still looking at ways that we can, we can make things faster, um, because we're always, we're always in search of the, the holy grail of just you know, under a minute of build times, or even just a few seconds of build times. So we're looking and we're excited about the progress that we've made, um, but we still want to get further. Speaking of performance, most developers really care about performance, and they want to know, how do I check the performance of my feature? How do I make it fast? I tell them, well, that's really complicated, because unless you've spent a lot of time doing performance analysis, you don't have very good experience, and you don't have a lot of these inclinations that really good performance engineers do. Um, so it's really hard to instill all of this knowledge and all of this experience in every single developer on our team. And this goes back to what we're talking about with specialized knowledge. We want to remove having to have this specialized knowledge. So at one point in time, our app actually got two times slower. It was really bad. And here's how that happened. In early 2017, React Redux released version 5. And I was looking at it, and I looked at the TLDR. Hey, it's a backwards compatible API, even though it's a major version. Let's try it out. Oh, look, a bonus. Uh, it's actually got performance improvements. I was really excited about this. And then this happened. This is the uh, 95th percentile of how long it takes for a tweet to update every, on every state change. And I mean every state change. So if you like a tweet, it would take over almost, actually, over 200 milliseconds to update the tree. So you would tap that button, and the heart would stay outlined and not filled in. And 200 milliseconds later, then it would change. It was a noticeable lag for a large portion of our users. So what did we do? In comes something that I open sourced a long time ago called React Component Benchmark. Uh, please. Uh, Try and use this, and also, if you have a chance, update it to hooks, because I haven't had time to do that yet. Um, but it works really well, and we actually use it in our application, and I use this in order to give a small reproduction case in our application, in which we actually render this UI for our developers. And we show them, you can run a, an update or a mount benchmark, and you can do it over a certain number of runs, and you can do it on any component in our system. This one was just an example container that that proved the issue on any Redux connected component in a that was built in a certain way. And so what we saw was the before um, was 25 milliseconds to update, and the after was the exact same type of thing, almost a 2x increase up to 49. 
So we filed an issue. It actually turns out uh, it was, it's something in our stack that was causing the problem. It was not React Redux's issue, um, so awesome for them. Kind of sucks for us because we still don't know why. <laughs> the next piece of it was automating the pull request review. This can be painstakingly slow because too many manual checks are ripe with the possibility to miss things and forget things. So back to the don't skip the basics. Uh, run all of the same conformance checks that we did on pre-commit, but do the entire thing in CI. It's okay that this still takes a little bit longer because we're failing faster on, on the developer side. So again, we run lint, we run tests, we run prettier, we run type checking, either TSC or flow. And then I wanted to move on though to something near and dear to my heart over the past couple years, which is performance budgeting. You say, what is performance budgeting? Well, performance budgeting is setting a limit on, your, on any given metric in your application that you must not exceed. And the, the metric that we usually talk about when we talk about performance budgeting, and if you've listened to the Chromium team talk about this at all, or, or Lighthouse team talk about it, it's usually bundle size. So originally, we had just three JavaScript artifacts, and I've kind of highlighted them here. Um, it would take over five seconds to load them on a 3G network. It was about a megabyte in size. So by adding route-based and intelligent code splitting in Webpack, we were able to reduce that from five seconds on 3G to under three seconds on 3G, sometimes less. And I think we're still about there now, but we've got even more complicated code splitting. Um, still using Webpack, still doing it the same way. But now we're asking, well, how does adding this dependency affect my bundle size? Every time a developer adds something, they have to know inherently what it's going to do to the build size. And originally, this was a painstaking process because the author would need to go back, run a couple builds, report back with that information, usually, usually paste a large markdown table into the app or into the, the pull request, and then we would actually know whether or not something caused a problem. So instead of this manual process, today I'm happy to share something that I actually published the alpha build yesterday and found there was a break in it and I published a new one today. Um, something that we've also been using in-house at Twitter, um, but that I developed on, my, on the side, is called Build Tracker. And what this does is it automates away this process for you. So this is a very shortened version. Remember I said we have about 140 different scripts. So you can imagine this was a very long table originally. Um, and it shortens this process out. So you have your, your before on the left-hand column, and then your after on the, right, on the middle column, and then on the right-hand side, it shows you the delta between the two. And this is what we were looking at originally. And it was a little bit of an overload, because imagine that you're fixing a small bug, and you keep making a mistake, and you keep pushing new changes up to your PR. And what happens is every time you do that, you post another one of these into a comment and now it's information overload. The signal to noise ratio has gone far too, too much to the noise side, and developers just start ignoring this, right? So you're actually missing on, the, on these breaking changes that would be problematic. So we start to reduce the clutter, and we look at only what's possibly a warning, or what's maybe an error, and we cut that down to the very basics, the entire thing, and then the actual change that was causing an issue. And then lastly, what we really want to see is just this one line that has a little green check mark that says, all good to go. The one thing I actually also want to note is that there's always a URL in these. You can see it down at the bottom in blue there. What that means is that on Build Tracker, you actually get this UI, where you can see all of your builds over time, historically, forever, as long as you've been building it. And you can do deep dive analysis into each change and see everything that changed from commit to commit to commit. So that's available today at buildtracker.dev. And then lastly, uh, type errors. And this, this starts running into uh, our, our staging for our internal users. And these are my enemy. These, uh, sorry. Every time a type error happens, we've crashed the application. And that means that we've had to set up error boundaries and component did catch in React in order to prevent the user from having a completely stalled out application that's completely unusable. So we've done that, but still it's not great because at this point, how does the user continue on? 
So what we really want to do is eliminate type errors. We want to be less than 1% of our users experiencing type errors. And that was our metric in September 2017. We were at about 0.8% of application instances crashing. And we were able to kind of chalk this up to probably random chance. Um, nothing looked really, really clear or was following along at the same time with the same errors. So we figured it was probably unsupported browser versions, and we actually had some, some uh, uh, browser, browser, uh, browser strings to be able to confirm that they were slipping through the cracks. Suddenly, October 2017, we jumped to 12%, and we couldn't figure out why, but this is what that graph looked like. It jumped all over the place. And then continuing on, we, we continued to see this 12% bit. So we said, the only way to actually do this is to remove the chance of type errors. So we went back to type safety. A lot of people have talked about TypeScript earlier today. We actually ended up with Flow. Um, to be clear, either one is good. <laughs> we chose Flow before TypeScript was able to use Babel, um, and for many other reasons, it was much easier for us to onboard onto Flow than anything else. When we're talking about over 3,000 JavaScript files and conversion, uh, we would have had to change a lot of plugins. It just wasn't going to be sustainable. So that aside, any type safety is good type safety. Uh, and this is what our graph continued on looking like as we went through the year. And we started, we started adding type safety um, in 2018 in the springtime, and you can see it's kind of a rocky bit. And then we've got these three really big spikes of type errors. And what those were, were issues that hit production. Actual big problems that had to be reverted immediately, and that's why they drop off immediately. But then you'll see on the right-hand side of this graph, it actually kind of trails off. And it really trails off, and it falls back to zero. This is when we hit over 50% of type coverage in our application, and this was phenomenal for us. This is a look at that whole graph from 20, September 2017 all the way through uh, earlier this spring. So it was really, really great. We've hit this milestone and we're continuing on hoping to get to 100% type coverage soon. And one of the things uh, I did mention we use error boundary. So here's a simple, simple version of that. If you're not using it, check out the React docs for it. Um, this is pretty much copy paste right from there. Um, it's real easy to use. And our metric software which showing those graphs is actually very easy to, to use as well. It's, it's more or less a graphite graphing instance with StatsD under the hood, both open source technologies that you can post uh, information to any time you catch an error. And then lastly, continuing to catch these errors with internal staging, we use Sentry. Uh, this is kind of a nice little plug for some friends at Sentry who I, I like a lot. They've done a lot for us and they've done a, just a heck of a job with their tool in order to catch errors like this. So this is what happens anytime an error is logged in our production instance. This is an actual screenshot of something that happened. in actually, it's production. You can see it says production at the top. Um, and we, we can see this. We can dive into it. We get stack traces. We get breadcrumbs for what the user has possibly done before this happened. And then even more so, we interrupt all of ourselves in our Slack channel every time an issue happens in our internal staging in this early bird feed. Um, anytime a new error is posted, we post one of these straight to Slack, and it's our job to fix that immediately. And that's it. So to recap, what I want you to take away from today is that you should be failing fast locally. Fail as fast as possible so you get instant feedback. Create tools that will help you spread knowledge and not people, um, because people spreading knowledge is actually kind of wasted time when you can automate that away. And then automating review checks. Using performance budgets, check out Build Tracker. It's helped us a lot. It's caught some really potential serious issues before they actually made it to production, and we're really happy with it. And then alert your errors before they hit production. Find a way to, to post those to yourselves and act on them before they hit your users. And here are links to all those things. Thank you very much.